Coming up on DTNS, Mozilla 70 launches with more tracking protection. Verizon gives away Disney Plus and private alternatives to Google products. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, October 22nd, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the dark forests of Finland, I'm Patrick Beja. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We were just talking about some of those dark forests, and we were talking about the passage of time and Christmas traditions and all kinds of good things on Good Day Internet. Uh, become a member and get the expanded show at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Sources tell CNBC that SoftBank has advanced talks to take control of workspace company WeWork, which would value WeWork between $7.5 and $8 billion and give SoftBank up to 70% or even more control of the company. Last month, WeWork canceled its plans to go public after its IPO prospectus in August revealed a $900 million loss in the first six months of 2019. The company was reportedly going to lay off 2,000 people, about 13% of its staff, as of last week. Mm. The European Data Protection Supervisor, or EDPS, has found, quote, serious concerns over the compliance of the relevant contractual terms with data protection rules and the role Microsoft and the role of Microsoft as a processor for EU institutions using its products and services. Microsoft said it, quote, will soon announce contractual changes that will address concerns such as those raised by the EDPS. Remember last month when uh, we saw that leaked paper on NASA server briefly from Google that uh, if, if, if it were, you know, a, a, a final paper would have indicated that the company had achieved quantum supremacy, quantum supremacy being uh, the idea that a quantum computer could perform some kind of calculation, in this particular case, a technique for determining random numbers, in an amount of time that was reasonable compared to a classical computer taking an unreasonable or impractical amount of time. However... IBM researchers have proposed a method in which a classical computer could achieve the calculation described in Google's paper in a practical amount of time. IBM's method would require using hard drive space, so kind of like a RAM disk, uh, in addition to RAM and other optimizations to perform the calculation in two and a half days rather than the 10,000 years Google's method would have required. Google still hasn't published that paper, and IBM hasn't tried their method, so this is all theoretical. But uh, just so you know, we... Don't have clear quantum supremacy achieved yet. Not determined yet. All right. Damn it. Let's talk a little bit about Facebook, Patrick. Mm, must we? I guess we must. New York State Attorney General Letitia James announced that 31 more U.S. Attorney Generals have joined her investigation into Facebook, bringing the total to 47, including James. The investigation seeks to determine whether Facebook's actions may have endangered consumer data, reduced the quality of consumers' choices, or increased the price of advertising. Yeah, so you got 45 states on board now, uh, as well as the District of Columbia and Guam. Uh, I think, actually, I say that, Puerto Rico might be in here too, I can't remember, but... Uh, that's pretty overwhelming. Uh, significantly, California's attorney general not on board for this investigation of Facebook. I guess that's probably not super surprising, but uh, also not surprising that all these attorneys general thought it might be good for their reelection campaigns to be seen as going after Facebook. Also, I, I of course, there needs to be an investigation to, to have make the de determination, but at least the first part, uh, have they endangered consumer data? I think I know what the answer to that one is going to be. Well, yes and no. I mean, has there has consumer data from Facebook been endangered? Oh, yes. There, there's no debate about that. Was it Facebook's fault? Were they negligent? That's the kind of thing this investigation has to determine. I think you could make an argument. Uh, Facebook certainly has made the argument that yeah, I stand it was by my, unavoidable. my answer. Well, that's you know Mark Zuckerberg's whole like this is the fifth realm or whatever his you know fifth estate yeah fifth, fifth estate. estate yeah the latest thing. It's kind of like well fifth this element. is this is a thing that we did wrong, but. It's new. We're still figuring it out, everybody, which is actually true. It is true. Yeah, I think there are a lot of the fifth estate argument makes sense in a lot of ways. The question of whether or not Facebook endangered consumer data, I think, is separate from that. And it's one of the elements of the investigation. But mm -hmm. I think it's different. You know, many companies may or may not endanger consumer data. 
uh, maybe I'm wrong. I'm surprised it, you're. It, it would be the easier one to prove. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, speaking of another company, <laughs> sometimes people think of as you know having any trust issues, but not in this sense. Google announced that its AI chatbot Google Duplex will launch in New Zealand as part of a limited test to confirm holiday hours for a handful of local businesses, making this the first time that Duplex has expanded, even in a test outside of the U.S. Google says that businesses participating in the test will receive an automated call from Google asking to confirm their hours for the upcoming Labor Day public holiday, which is on October. 28th. Those times will then be automatically updated on maps and search. Well, I learned two things here. Uh, one, uh, Labor Day is October 28th in New Zealand. That's Yay. interesting. Uh, but also uh, that Google wants to be seen as reliable for these holiday hours. Because man, when I see holiday hours on the internet right now, I don't trust it. I assume that it's old or mistaken because it so often is. So if they're going to do this, if they're going to test Google Duplex, which I think this is a great test, automated calls, uh, it's got a limited scope, helps them refine the algorithm. That's mm -hmm. all great. But up at the end, they need to be telling me, like, we just called and confirmed these hours or I'm not going to trust it. Uh, it's because they're so often wrong. Or they get this into the system on a consistent basis and you just get used to having reliable holiday hours over, you know, maybe not well, today. But how do we but, get to the point where we know that they are reliable, right? That's my question. Because they're always reliable if you're using Google. But I if I never trust want. them, then I'll never know whether they're reliable. If, so no, that's some, true. But if there's some sort of like, you know, check mark or star or whatever, you know, where no, it's like that's... Google Duplex has verified this and you, you know, we get to the point where it's like more and more, it's like, oh, okay, that, that's great. That's, you know, that was a vetting process that we all believe in, then, you know, that would be helpful. Yes. But if they do it well enough, they don't even need the the check to say not, oh, sure. you know, yeah. the others are not super reliable, but this one is. And over time, you just don't even need the check mark. You just think that Google's data is reliable. I would you know, like to live in that Candyland world you are describing, but I'm not sure how we Which, get. Well, in a couple of years, if uh, duplex and other methods are used consistently and efficiently, we might. Yeah. We might, Tom. Be optimistic. Stop thinking yeah. of the future, Patrick. I want to complain about right now. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Live in the now, man. <laughs> Mozilla launched Firefox 70 for Windows, Mac, Linux, Android, and iOS across the board. Uh, you're getting new social tracking protection. Uh, which blocks cross-site tracking cookies from sites like Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Fa uh, Firefox has been doing a lot of tracking protection natively within the browser, uh, so you didn't even have to use like a privacy badger or no script or anything like that, but now they're expanding it to include social networks. A privacy protections report will now let you see how many trackers, both uh, the normal trackers and the social trackers, fingerprints and crypto miners that Firefox has blocked for you. Uh, so you can track the trackers, basically, is what Therat uh, pointed out that means. Uh, Firefox's password management service, Lockwise, now has a password generator and will feed some data into the Firefox monitor to alert you if one of your accounts may have been involved in a breach. It'll say like, oh, there's been a breach at this account. Would you like to check and see if your account was was part of that? Uh, the green lock icon in the address bar is now gray to sort of de-emphasize, you know, to kind of say like, hey, a secure site should be normal, so gray, right? Uh, and now an insecure HTTP and FTP connection will show a red crossout logo to say like, you shouldn't be trusting this connection. Uh, Firefox 70 also strips the path information from the HTTP referrer sent to trackers that if you do get tracked, will give them less information to go on. And on the performance side, uh, on Windows, Web Render is rolling out, running on integrated Intel graphics, and Compositor updates on macOS should speed things up and reduce power consumption there. You know, interesting UX to to have gone from that sort of green check mark to the gray. Mm. And you might go, well, yeah, green means go, isn't that good? But that is it's a it's a subtle but important distinction, right? Because everything is supposed to be secure. If for some reason it isn't, that's when you get a flag. Uh, and I think that that's I don't know, it's smart on whoever's you know behind the design team on Firefox. But all in all, these features are, they're rock solid. Uh, I, you know, I talked on the show yesterday about uh, browsers being one of those things that I drag my feet on the very most, just because they're such a big part of my daily existence and my work and everything that I fear change. 
but uh, but I used to use Firefox, and this might be what's taken me back. Yeah, my, my my reaction to this is, is there a reason not to use Firefox? And I say this as someone who doesn't use Firefox as my primary browser, but there's no reason not to use it. I mean, right? unless there's a site you use that doesn't work well in Firefox, right? Which th there, there are examples of that. And that, yeah. that's true of a lot of browsers. Like, well, I'd use it, but it doesn't work well in Chrome for whatever reason. That's the only thing I can think of. It is zippity fast on Mac OS now. That is a technical term that I use. Uh, <laughs> usually I only use that term with brand new browsers, like when Vivaldi first came out or Edge for Chromium first came out because browsers that are brand new are always fast because they haven't had time to build up things in the code, right? When they're built from scratch. Firefox feels like it was built from scratch right now. Uh, so uh, yeah, I have switched. I, I am using Firefox 70 right now as we speak. Hmm. Well... If only I, I didn't have so many darn Chrome tabs that are really nice uh, uh, over <laughs> cross-platform uh, devices that I have. You can use Firefox Sync and get your tabs cross-platform. Fine. Mm -hmm. All right. That's, that's true. All right. We can. Yeah, project. I don't know. I don't know why I I don't use it, but for some reason, you know, it's really the. I guess it is a uh, an example of the importance of getting that market share on browsers because people if i don't switch as a tech uh, uh, enthusiast mm -hmm. then uh, uh, normal people certainly won't well it's one of those things where when i when i decided to move all my tabs over to firefox i was like ah this is going to be a pain it wasn't uh, you know, I logged into Google for my Google Drive and then Gmail and everything else was and fine. It, yeah. It's it's yeah. a mental barrier more than an actual yeah, barrier. That, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, talking about Google, Google Fi connects to three LTE providers, Sprint, T-Mobile, and U.S. Cellular, depending on which one it thinks is the fastest. Up until now, it had to disconnect briefly to switch. Starting with the Pixel 4, a new feature called Dual Connect will let Google Fi make the switch without the disconnect, claiming you could watch a video during the switch and not see a blip. Google uh, uses Dual SIM Dual Standby, aka DSDS, to have two connections happen at once, both to Google Fi. So you'll need a physical Fi SIM along with a uh, the eSIM in your Pixel 4. The feature will roll out to Pixel 4s over the next few weeks and eventually come to other Fi compatible phones. This is a little bit geeky uh, for sure, and it's not as cool as Dual SIM Dual Active, which would actually bind the bandwidth together and give you a faster connection, uh, which probably the carriers are not too happy with Google doing, which is probably why they haven't used DSDA. Uh, but DSDS is a great way to make that seamless. Now, granted, if I'm watching a video, there's all kinds of things that could make it screw up. So I'm sure someone's going to be doing this and go, hey, I've made my video screw up. Uh, but you know, theoretically, it should be able to do seamless connections like that, which is, which is really good, uh, and 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 something that will make Fi even more attractive. I've always been uh, something of a fan of Google Fi, uh, just because of the fact that it has a pretty straightforward billing situation and has international uh, roaming, and also the the ability to go on multiple networks at once like that. Well, and this is the sort of thing where, you know, you've explained what Google is doing to make uh, something like watching a video more seamless. But for somebody who doesn't really understand what's going on under the hood, you would just say, I don't know, Google Fi is like mostly fine, but sometimes there's these like weird blips and uh -huh. I don't know, you know. And yeah, so yeah. that is this, is, this is just like one more reason that someone would say, oh, yeah, no, this is like a legitimate, yeah. uh, solid uh, connection option. I used to have these weird blips, but I guess they, they don't happen anymore. It's yeah. great. Yeah, this would be why. <laughs> I, I wonder why Google Fi has not expanded beyond, I guess it's only the U.S., right? But they do have roaming internationally. Yeah, I am I wonder if it's just the 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 complexity of becoming an MVNO in, in other countries that they just don't want to have to deal with. Uh, that's a good question. I guess, yeah. Could, I, could one, I guess there's a limit to what you can roam internationally. You have to make deals it. with everybody, yeah. No, sorry, I meant could one, uh, could a European get a Google Fi uh account and sure. then use them in yeah. europe 
but it's a lot maybe, of trouble because then you have to you have to make sure that Google will give you the account, you know, so it, they have to think yeah. you're an American, which right. might be distasteful to some. I have no idea. <laughs> Well, speaking of connectivity, Verizon will give all new and existing Verizon wireless customers, also new Fios customers, and new 5G home internet customers of Verizon's, a year of Disney Plus for free when the service launches on November 12th. Disney Plus is $6.99 per month on its own, with TV shows and movies from Disney, Marvel, Pixar, Star Wars, and others. We've talked about Disney Plus quite a bit on the show, but uh, yeah, if you're a Verizon customer get it for free. I'm a Verizon customer. I'm looking forward to it because I'm not sure I would have paid for it otherwise. Not because I don't think it's a great service, just because, you know, I kind of have that service fatigue where I'm like, well, I pay for other things. I I don't Mm. know if I need this, but, but getting me in for a year, if it's a good enough service, if it's, if the platform is solid, then for $7 in a year from now, I'll be like, yeah, no, I need that. Um, Two things. First of all, I would pay multiples of the seven bucks to get access to this service, which I guess is coming to Europe at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's already in, also, a, in the Netherlands right now. They got the yeah, but that's the test, mm-hmm. and it's just in. I'm the just Netherlands. saying, Europe got it first, Patrick. I I guess what I'm hearing is that I could move to the Netherlands, and I will consider it. <laughs> no, I think um, you get it on November 12th. I don't know if it's in Finland per se, but there are plenty of European countries getting it November 12th. Right. No, wait, no, 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 no. I don't think so. Uh, I th- I'm i pretty sure maybe it's the UK. We can check that, but uh, I think it's very few European countries, if maybe the UK and that's it. Um, but I would pay more. And Sarah, within a year, it might be more expensive because there's no way that the service well, is going to remain right. at that price. Right, right. Um, I just think, I think it's, you know, it's smart. And, you know, we're, we're seeing more and more of these, you know, this carrier has decided to, you know, give you some sort of either, a, you know, a free or a, or a discounted option of this platform because the two companies had made a deal, you know, ahead of time um, in order to get customers uh, you know, to, and, to make to make us feel like we we're, yeah like we 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 are dependent on on yeah. on these platforms for a certain content, and maybe it will be the case, and maybe it won't. I mean, there's so much competition right now, but I do think it's it, it's smart of you know Verizon's kind of like, hey, you know, we'll take one for the team here. I mean, T-Mobile uh, has done a T-Mobile Tuesday thing uh, where they gave away MLB.tv access the past two years. I haven't paid for MLB.tv the past two years because I'm a T-Mobile subscriber. You mentioned the Quibi thing uh, with T-Mobile. So these platforms, what's interesting is instead of zero rating, they're going for like just giving you things for free uh, as a way to entice you onto your platform, uh, which, yeah, I I agree. I I think that's a a much better way to go. And it's not unlike... When I, my service now, which it's going to change because I'm about to move, but uh, I use uh, Comcast as my provider right now. And, you know, I was on a one year really great internet speed plan, knowing that after the year it was all going to go up. But, you know, that's that this is a very common industry practice that people use all the time. Whether or not they stay is, you know, that's up to them. But it, it gets you. Uh, dependent on, you know, some sort of a business for something that you use in your everyday life. And then you end up saying, oh, I have to pay you now or I have to pay you more now. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. No, it's a good for Disney Plus for sure. Uh, Patrick, the, the most important part of this story is that both of us get to say we're right. Uh, it is launching in Europe only in the Netherlands on November 12th, because they already have it as part of the preview. Uh, It comes to Australia and New Zealand on November 19th, and then Western Europe... Uh, gets it 2020. in twenty the first half of 2020, Eastern Europe, first half of 2021, Latin America, first half of 2021, Asia and Pacific throughout 2020 and 2021. So yeah, not not launching everywhere November 12th, but it is eventually coming to most mm-hmm. parts of the world. Yeah. There, yeah. I'm not going to say what I was going to say. Folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Ed Bott at ZDNet has an article up called How to Replace Each Google Service with a More Privacy-Friendly Alternative. 
Uh, Ed Bott, of course, a, a great uh, tech reporter and, and tech pundit uh, for many, many years. And I thought we would be, uh, it thought it'd be fun to just look over Ed's suggestions and maybe make a few of our own here. Uh, now, we'll start with mobile OS where he says, well, you have Apple. That's your choice. <laughs> uh, if you don't want an iPhone, then you're stuck on Android. And and that's not 100% true. There are a few other very small operating systems out there, and, and you can find those and, and dig them up. Uh, but they don't have wide support. They don't have wide development for the apps. Uh, so he's he's sort of mostly right of like, well, if you want the complete range of, of services and apps available, you're probably stuck between Android and iOS, right? Yeah, I, th I like his approach. He's essentially talking to regular people who want to get actual uh, viable alternatives, not the privacy-obsessed uh, geek, maybe in our circles, uh, yeah. who wants the best Somebody who's willing to live with just web versions of things because they're like, exactly. I want to live on Sailfish. That's all I want to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I I think it's a good uh, thing to point out that it's easy. Uh, we often read these headlines, and we might even say this ourselves. You know, well, iOS says it's more secure or private, but look at this that happened. Ha ha! You don't really realize that if you use uh, Facebook or whatever service, then Apple doesn't protect you from that. So is it really more secure? Well, yes, it's more private. And on the OS level, of course, you can always screw things up on top of it. But overall, the uh, Apple OS is more respectful of your privacy than uh, Android. And, you know, it's almost it's also more pricey. There are trade-offs, but... You overall, can just send those emails is. straight to Patrick uh, for that <laughs> statement. I will, uh, but I will back you up, I mean, Patrick. send them to uh, Edbot. Yeah. But I, I mean, uh, Apple... <laughs> Apple Android can be just as private as Apple. You have to work harder to do. It. That's kind of my take yeah. on it. Uh, yeah, Apple makes it easier for average people, like you said, uh, to do that. Browser-wise, he recommends Edge, the Chromium beta. He says it's pretty stable, even though it's a beta. He's like, don't use the Edge that's on Windows right now. Get the new one that is built on the Chromium e engine. And he loves the simple tracking protection. Now, I'm a big fan of the Firefox tracking protection, but it's kind of the same thing as Android, which is... I I am I want that extra control and that extra data that Firefox gives me. Now Firefox makes it really simple, uh, but Microsoft makes it Microsoft interface on Edge might be even more attractive to people who otherwise might not worry about their privacy. Yeah, it 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 sounds like to me from what I understand he is recommending Edge for is Firefox 70. It's they're kind of neck and neck. Same yeah, idea. Definitely, definitely. Um, what about search? Uh, he points out that Bing is really your only major competitor to Google, but DuckDuckGo uses the Bing results as well as results from other search engines. It does a, an amalgamation of them. So you get the best of Bing plus and DuckDuckGo. Uh, it's not perfect. People have shown where it's like, well, they, they don't protect privacy in this way. They don't protect privacy in that way. But boy, do they protect it more than your Google search. It would be easy for me to say, Oh, please, you know, I'm not going to use Google search. I mean, it is it is now a verb that is part of the vernacular of the entire world. However, we have enough people in our audience, certainly, um, who use DuckDuckGo and swear by it that I know that it is not like some crappy search engine that you're using just because you don't want to use Google. It's actually a very good one. Yeah, I use it every day. It's my default search engine on my phone. Mm. There you go. I've been using uh, Quant, which is actually a French oh, yeah. search engine, um, and it's it's fine. You know, I still default to back to not default, but I still go back to Google every once in a while. Mm -hmm. But I've been using Quant as yeah, like sometimes I I think Google might be a little bit more um, complete, but for if if even if you use your default search engine most of the time and then if you really want something specific you go to google then um it's you're better protecting your privacy of course it's, i do all of this in chrome so it's kind of moot but it's not even completion it's almost like a flavor of search there's a certain flavor of search that i know google is better at uh it usually yeah. has to do with like immediacy like oh this, they're gonna have great example is uh rise of skywalker trailer breakdown 
uh, I used Google for that search because I knew they were on it faster than DuckDuckGo would be. But I yeah. always go into DuckDuckGo, use the bang G command, which then sends my search to Google without any of my identifying information on it. So I'm using Google, but I'm protecting my information. Uh, anyway, EdBot's got other uh, great uh, recommendations over there. Uh, Line 2 as an alternative to Google Voice. Outlook.com, he argues, is is better than Gmail. Uh, points out, you know, Office 365, Dropbox, Box, et cetera, uh, as alternatives to Google Drive. He doesn't really have a good alternative for Google Photos or YouTube. But let's finish with his Maps recommendation where he says, hey, folks, get over it. Apple Maps is good now. You know, one of the uh, Apple Maps has been a, a, you know, a punching bag of Maps apps uh, for some time with good reason. When it first launched, it was lackluster compared to alternatives. Google Maps being, of course, the, you know, kind of front runner. Because I have been using CarPlay so much with my car now that 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 does um, support it uh, when I'm, you know, I can. I can use Google Maps or Waze or I can use whatever Maps app um, that CarPlay is, is compatible with if I want. But if I'm using Siri, that's what is going to launch. And so just because I'm not always thinking about it as a default, I do end up using it quite a bit. And I'll tell you, it hasn't really led me astray the way that it used to. It, it does seem like a pretty solid product at this point, at least in the U.S., at least in my neighborhood or you know where I'm going. That's what I was going to say. I'm not sure how uh, much better it is than it was before outside of the U.S. It seems fine. But on something that is tangential, uh, opening hours, we were talking about in uh, Good Day Internet, um, I just had a bad experience a week ago because I was using Apple Maps. But on the map side, I think it's on par. On the actual navigation side, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Sometimes we talk about navigation there. Sometimes we talk about other things. You can submit stories and vote others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. All right, let's check in with Chris Christensen, our amateur traveler, who's back with a handy app to help you find your next scooter rental. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. If you like using scooters to get around town, things like bird lift, lime, spin, jump, etc. But one of the things you don't like is that you have to use a number of different apps to find scooters, then there is an app for you. And that app is ScooterMap.com. That app will help you find scooters and put them on a map for a number of different companies that do rental scooters. So if you like scooters, get ScooterMap.com. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. But will it help you find Scooter Lane? <laughs> Hold it. Hard to time. say. Hard to well, pin it down. Not. Well, if you're using Apple Maps, no. <laughs> All right. We got time for one quick email. Let's check out the mailbag. Uh, go to Mon on Patreon actually was uh, responding regarding Tom's recent differential privacy special episode that we ran on the October, Just over a week ago. Yeah, October 15th. Ago. Yes. Yeah. My, uh, Gotamon said, my girlfriend is in grad school and was telling me about a class where they learn about K anonymity. And because I listened to this episode, I was able to engage in a meaningful conversation and come off looking impressive. So thanks for what you do. Yeah, I think it was the Epsilon, uh, the Epsilon stuff that I talked about on differential privacy uh, came in handy. That I love, I love that. That is what we want to do. We want to make you feel like, hey, wait a minute, I know this, uh, when you're in a conversation about technology. So I'm um, very, very glad to hear that. And uh, folks, if you missed that differential privacy episode, like we said, October 15th, it's there at dailytechnewsshow.com. Shout out to our patrons at the master and grandmaster levels, including Jeff Wilkes, Sonia Vining, and Ken Hayes. Thanks, everybody. Also, thanks to Patrick Beja for being with us today. Patrick, what is new in your world? I guess uh, everything all the time, but in particular... Go check out the latest episode of Pixels, which was recorded just a few days ago. If you want to learn more about what's been happening with Blizzard and China and gaming in general, we do a significant discussion about all of this, go into the different aspects. And uh, I think you will come out understanding a little bit more about it than you did before. That show is called Pixels, and you can find it anywhere you find podcasts. And uh, also, I'm not Patrick on Twitter. 
folks, I'm so excited uh, that we're just over a week uh, from the new Patreon rewards uh, being delivered. I, 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 I can't wait to sit down on November 1st and figure out like, okay, here's what I do. Here's what I get to send to. Here are the new people. Uh, so if you want to be one of those, uh, patreon.com slash DTNS. And don't forget, if you're uh, starting at the $2 level, if, if you're at the dollar level, you won't get this. You need to be at the $2 level by November 1st to get a PDF copy of the official DTNS Good Day Internet Cookbook. $2 or more. Uh, anybody above gets it as well. So sign up right now. Patreon.com slash DTNS. If you heard anything in the show and thought, ah, oh, wow, I really want to give this some feedback. I have some thoughts about this or that or the other thing. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com is where to send those emails. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC for limited time anyway. Find out more at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Just live. <laughs> This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>